Please take your Bibles with me and turn to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs 24, beginning at verse 11. Deliver those who are being taken away to death, and those who are staggering to slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say, see, we did not know this. Does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his work? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies that we've already been able to meditate on in the reading of the Scriptures and the praying and in song. And we ask that we might be Christ's soldiers who are faithful, true, and bold. And that we in our generation would fight as those saints who nobly fought of old. And we pray that when we think of the wars of our generation, that we would not shrink back and withdraw and faint. We pray, Father, that you would give us courage to fight in such a way that would receive the well done, good and faithful servant at the end of the day. We pray your help then this hour. Revive our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. John Bunyan describes the meeting of Christian there in the Valley of Humiliation with a giant fiend named Apollyon who in Pilgrim's Progress is found straddling the King's Highway defying the good man Christian's passage. Here are the words of Bunyan. The monster Apollyon was hideous to behold. He was clothed with scales like a fish. He had wings like a dragon, feet like a bear, and out of his belly came fire and smoke. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. Then did Christian draw his sword, and Apollyon made as fast at him, throwing darts as thick as hail, wounding Christian in his head, his hand, his foot, making Christian give back a little. But Apollyon pressed forward. Christian took courage and fought as long as he manfully could. This sore conflict hasted a long time, till Christian was almost quite spent and continued to grow weaker and weaker, so that Christian began to despair of life. You see, because of the duration of the fight, Christian began to suffer from what could be called battle fatigue. Worn down by the sheer time and length of the war. Christian, we see, despaired, and he began to entertain thoughts that his resistance against the monster was a fool's errand. And he became tempted to throw up his hands and simply surrender the battle. Now, dear Christian, Soldiers, this is exactly how some of us may feel in battling our 30 years war against the monster of abortion. On Wednesday, January 22, 2003, marks the 30th anniversary of of Roe v. Wade, the day that the monster of abortion appeared and straddled the path of human beings in the United States of America. 
the Roe v. Wade declaration by the Supreme Court basically said that the unborn fetus is not a living person and therefore is not protected by constitutional laws. And it seems that after three decades of preaching and praying and protesting, and three decades of marching and rescuing, and three decades of lobbying and legislating and litigating, it seems that the bloodthirsty monster stands as strong and as defiant as ever, smack in the middle, straddling our path. And our arms have grown tired of swinging our swords, and our minds have grown weary of warring with our words, And our consciences have become familiar with and desensitized to the fact of babies daily being marched into abortion clinics and daily being butchered in their mother's wombs. Battle fatigue. Weary. And this sermon's purpose is to seek to nurse back our strength to resolve, to resist and fight against the bloodthirsty monster of abortion. Though I can think of more pleasant sermons, I cannot think of many more necessary sermons. I want to address this issue to seek to revive us by dealing with eight headings. Eight headings this morning. The first heading is the political climate. The political climate. A man named Roger Simon wrote in the most recent U.S. News and World Report. He says, in the 30 years since the Supreme Court ruled in Roe v. Wade, abortion in this country has become safe, legal, and anything but rare. This is the political climate, the cultural climate in which we live. In fact, Simon writes, abortion has become one of the most common surgical procedures in our nation. So common that should the current rate continue, about 35% of all U.S. women will have an abortion in their lifetime. Further in describing the political climate, Ann Stone, who is the National Chair of Republicans for Choice. Ann Stone says this, If there is any chance that Roe v. Wade is overturned, then expect revolution in the streets. You would have mass demonstrations. There would be such a severe political backlash It would drive Republican women out of the party again. Trust me, Ann Stone says, the White House is not rah-rah for overturning abortion. That's a questionable opinion. But that's a very popular opinion that Stone writes on. Sadly, There are many individuals in our society who are in high places who idealistically and morally claim that they do not believe that abortion is a proper thing. But practically, they're willing, or shall I say they're unwilling, to take the political risks involved with their passing and pushing legislation that would outlaw abortion. A political scientist named Clyde Wilcox from Georgetown University has written, Some Republican strategists, and this is hot off the press just a few days ago, Some Republican strategists will tell you off the record that the worst thing in the world that could happen to the Republican Party would be overturning Roe versus Wade. And so many political Republicans are driven by pragmatics of keeping the Republicans in the majority as opposed to be driven by ethics, which is doing what is right 
come what may. So that's the political climate today. Come now to our second of main headings, and that is the biblical decree. The biblical decree. Regardless of the fog in our political landscape, the King of Kings has spoken and has ruled on this matter with the crystal clear pronouncement and verdict. On the basis of God's word, every man's duty is clear. It's clear by the court of Scripture. It's clear in the court of everyone's conscience. Those who would even suppress the truth and unrighteousness and possibly have been given over to a darkened mind. But the king's decrees on this issue of abortion are clear. Consider some biblical passages. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. The sixth commandment, you shall not murder. I don't know what could be clearer. Genesis 9, please turn there. Genesis 9. I know these are passages that we know. We need to have them ringing in our ears if we're to brighten our eyes regarding this battle. Genesis 9 and verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God... He made man. Made in the image of God. If you shed the blood of an image bearer, if you kill an image bearer, you have profoundly touched the apple of God's eyes and woe be to you. It says in verse 4 regarding that issue of blood and image. It says in verse 4, You shall not eat flesh with its life. That is, its blood. You shed blood, you take away life. Now, what in the world is a little infant in a womb? What is that which they impersonally like to call the fetus? Is it a tadpole? Is it something that comes from a frog or from a toad? No, not at all. We find in Genesis 1, reproduction, each Creature reproduces after its own kind. So that a man and a woman conceive something in the womb. What is it? It's not tadpole. It's not salmon. It is image. Image of God. And woe be to him who sheds the blood of an image bearer of God. Scientists clearly see that this little child in the womb, only a few moments old, has a unique genetic code. None other like him. The little one in the womb is an individual just conceived, has a heartbeat after 18 days, has clearly definable brain waves after 40 days in the womb. We're looking at the biblical decree. Consider with me intrauterine identity. In other words, when the baby is in the mother's womb, who is that? What is the status of that being there? It's clearly image-bearing personality, enjoying all the protections of God's sanctity of life decrees. Consider with me Job 31.15. You need not turn there. But Job speaks regarding the abusing of a slave in his day. And he hearkens back to the womb. To the fact that in the womb, all men are alike individuals before God. And he says this regarding his not abusing a slave. Did not he who made me, Job says, in the womb, make him, that is the slave, did not he who made me in the womb make him? And did not the same one fashion us both in the womb? Notice the personal pronouns given to me and to him and to us where? In the womb, personal identity, image of God. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5. Jeremiah being spoken to by God. God says, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb... I knew you. 
And before you were born, I consecrated you. I set you apart in the womb. The Lord goes on. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. While still in the womb, God was placing His hands on Jeremiah. Who was Jeremiah? Image bearer, whose mouth would speak the very words of God to the souls of men. The appointment made in the womb. The familiar passage is Psalm 139. Please turn there. Psalm 139, beginning at verse 13. I know we know them. We need to be stirred up by way of memory. For thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from thee. When I, you see the personal pronouns here, the intimacy between God and the little infant in the womb. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, thine eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not yet one of them. You see that intimately cherished person that God is fashioning in the womb. Woe be to the person who would dare break into God's workshop while he's at work and acts God's loom and slice to shreds God's masterpieces and tear from God's fingertips his wonderful children when they had lived out only but a few of their days, which God had ordained for them. Further, Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. Is the child in the womb really personality? Oh, of course. Individual enough and image enough to in the womb be imputed with Adam's guilt and to in the womb be a hell-deserving sinner. No tadpole or salmon has that status. In the womb is image of God. And please turn with me to Luke 1. Luke 1. And notice what John the Baptist, while in the womb, notice what he is called. He is not called fetus. He is called a baby. The word used is the Greek word brephos. Look what it says in Luke 1, verse 41. And it came about, then when, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Also, verse 44, For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached into my ears, the baby, Brephos, leaped in my womb. Now, if you would read in the next chapter, we find that the baby Jesus, born, held, wrapped in swaddling clothes, is called a brephos. A baby, as it says in Luke 2.12, the baby was wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And it says in verse 16 of Luke 2, the baby, this is baby Jesus. Now what is the identity of that being in the swaddling clothes, lying in the manger? It's a brephos. It's a baby. And what, pray tell, is the identity of that being that is in the womb? It's a brephos. It's a baby. God did not make a mistake misidentifying that which was in the womb and that which was without the womb, both the same. Image-bearing babies. Infants. In the Scriptures, God's fierce anger is against those who would slay the unborn. In Amos 1 and verse 13, a great curse given regarding Ammon. 
And it says of Ammon, for he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead. And woe be to Ammon, for the prophet says, they shall endure the fierce storm of God's wrath. What for? For ripping open pregnant women and destroying the fruit of their wombs. The biblical decree is clear, isn't it? Though the political climate may be foggy. And that leads us then thirdly to the diabolical slaughter. The diabolical slaughter. I say diabolical because just as Apollyon stood in the path of Christians so profoundly, the devil's work is in many ways empowering the monster of abortion in our day. John 8.44 says that he, the devil, is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Blood and death and murder. It's the handiwork of the devil. This legalized massacre of precious infants. I want to talk about the diabolical slaughter. Frankly, I'd prefer not to talk about it. It's not a pleasant thing to talk about. But I believe it's a necessary thing to talk about. Lest we begin yawning about it. And falling into a lethargic sleep about it. Went to Germany last summer. Saw many wonderful things. But one of the most important places I went to was Dachau. The German death camp where Jews were slaughtered in mass. It was a very troubling place to attend. It made me very uneasy, if not queasy, to go there to Dachau. To see the barracks. To see the death chambers. To see pictures of corpses. Dead bodies. Some with their eyes wide open. Piled high nearly to the ceiling. To see the actual death ovens out of which oil was skimmed for the production of soap was a very disturbing place to go. But the reason for going and the reason for their preserving that grotesque location is the slogan that's placarded over the gates which says this. We must never forget. We must never forget. And this is one of the ugliest sermons I've ever preached. But I placard over the gate this statement. We must never forget. Not only as it was in Germany, what did take place. But we must never forget and flush out of our minds what is today taking place. So consider with me the diabolical slaughter and the many ways that we do abortion. First, the term and the procedure is called suction. The abortionist first paralyzes the cervix, which is the womb opening. He then inserts a hollow plastic tube with a knife-like tip into the uterus. The tube is connected to a powerful pump with a suction force 29 times more powerful than a home vacuum cleaner. The procedure tears the baby's body into pieces and the hose frequently jerks as pieces of the baby become lodged. The placenta is then cut from the inner wall of the uterus and the scraps are sucked out into a bottle. And I watched this week that film I had never seen before, which is Silent Scream. And in that film, I watched a doctor narrating with a classroom pointer a live ultrasound film of an obviously distraught child being systematically dismembered by the vacuum blades. And it took my breath away. The doctor would say this as he's pointing to the ultrasound, which is quite clear. 
You see the baby's torso now being ground away. And now the baby's mouth opened wide as if screaming. But, the doctor says, a silent scream to be sure. Every day, every day, this is happening. A second way that we do abortion, we, that is, our people, our nation, it's called dilation and curatage, D and C. Somewhat uncommon today, but it is used during the first ten weeks of pregnancy. This is similar to the suction procedure, except the abortionist inserts a curate, a loop-shaped steel knife up into the uterus. He then cuts the placenta and baby into pieces and scrapes them out into a basin. Bleeding is usually profuse. Thirdly, salt poisoning, a.k.a. candy apple babies, most often used after the first trimester, that is the first three months, the abortionist injects a strong salt solution directly into the amniotic sac, that is the fluid surrounding the baby. The baby breathes and swallows it, is poisoned, struggles, and sometimes convulses. It takes over an hour to kill a baby. The mother delivers the dead baby in a day or two, sometimes alive. Why candy apple babies? The phrase. The corrosive effect of the salt solution often burns and strips away the outer layer of the baby's skin. This exposes the raw, red-glazed-looking subcutaneous layer of tissue. The baby's head sometimes looks like a candy apple. I didn't like going to Dachau either. But it was a good place to be able to see and behold the realities, lest we not forget. Fourthly, dilation and evacuation, called D&E. Performed during the second trimester, four to six months of pregnancy. This method has largely replaced saline and chemical abortions, which too frequently result in live births. A complication from the abortionist's perspective. Here a pliers-like instrument is needed because the baby's bones are calcified, as is the skull. The baby's big enough. There is no anesthetic for the baby. The abortionist inserts the instrument into the uterus, seizes a leg or other body part, and with a twisting motion tears it from the baby's body. This is repeated again and again. The spine must be snapped and the skull crushed to remove them. The nurse's job is to reassemble the body parts so as to be assured that they are all removed. And yes, I saw pictures of a put-together puzzle of a baby on a nurse's table. Every day. Every day. Fifthly, DNX, which is called partial birth. Also used for advanced pregnancies, the cervix is dilated to allow passage of a ring forceps. A foot or lower leg is located and pulled through the vagina. The baby is extracted in breech fashion until the head is just inside the cervix. The baby's legs hang outside the woman's body with the baby face down. Scissors are plunged into the baby's head at the nape of the neck and spread open to enlarge the wound. A suction tip is inserted and the baby's brain is removed. The skull collapses. The baby is delivered. Sharp and suction curatage is continued until the walls of the womb are clean. And let me just give a personal witness testimony of a nurse named Brenda Pratt Schaefer. Eyewitness account. She writes, In September of 1993, I was a registered nurse with 15 years of experience assigned by the nursing agency to an abortion clinic. Since I considered myself very pro-choice, I didn't think this assignment would be a problem. I was wrong. Here are her words. 
I stood at the doctor's side and watched him perform a partial birth abortion on a woman who was six months pregnant. The baby's heartbeat was clearly visible on the ultrasound screen. The doctor delivered the baby's body and arms, everything but his little head. The baby's body was moving. His little fingers were clasping together. He was kicking his feet. The doctor took a pair of scissors and inserted them into the back of the baby's head. And the baby's arms jerked out in a flinch, a startle reaction, like a baby does when he thinks he might fall. Then the doctor opened the scissors up. Then he stuck the high-powered suction tube into the hole and sucked the baby's brains out. Now the baby had gone completely limp. I never went back to the clinic, but I'm still haunted by the face of that little boy. It was the most perfect, angelic face that I have ever seen. Every day. Every day. Another way is prostaglandin abortions. More sophisticated. More sanitary, so they say. Three forms. Two are injected and one is a vaginal suppository. Its first approved use was for the induction of trimester abortion. The hormone produces a violent labor and delivery of whatever size baby the mother carries. If the baby is old enough to survive the trauma of the labor, it may be born alive, but is usually too small to survive. In one article among the complications listed was the complication of live birth. And the last I'll bring to you is the most sophisticated, the most sanitary of all, RU486, which is also called the morning after pill. A drug that produces an abortion taken after the mother misses her period. Its effect is to block the use of an essential hormone nutrient by the newly implanted baby who then dies and drops off. Note that RU486 is not a contraceptive because it does not prevent fertilization or implantation. It is used only after the mother has missed her period and the baby is at least two to three weeks old with a beating heart. The fetal heart begins to beat when the woman is four days late for her period. It is no longer effective after six to eight weeks. It's called an abortion cocktail. And this statement says, read how methotrexate, one of the primary drugs contained in RU486, read how methotrexate can cause in the pregnant woman liver damage, kidney destruction, heart muscle compromise, pulmonary failure, gastrointestinal pathology, and bone marrow suppression. It has also been reported to cause loss of speech function, strokes, and convulsions. Real neat. Little side effects, huh? The truth be told, it's a lie. Now let me just bring, because I've read read all these things and they seem quite impersonal, as I have almost in a monotone fashion described abortions and the way that we do them. Let me as... We look at the way we do abortions. Just read a personal testimony from a girl who had an abortion. Her name is Carrie H. She's now 20 in her writing this statement. She was dating a young man and at age 17 years old, because of her intimacy with her boyfriend, her fornication, she became pregnant. For days, she says, my boyfriend hounded me to have an abortion. I kept telling him no. I told my boyfriend that day that I had set up an appointment, though, for abortion, and he seemed all too relieved. I, on the other hand, was dying inside. I wanted my baby, but I also knew I wanted my boyfriend. 
So I went against what I thought was right and tried to forget about the little baby that was growing inside of me. Carrie goes on to describe. My appointment was set for November 4, 1999. I told my mom that I changed my mind and she said that she would respect whatever I had wanted to do. She asked me if I was sure I wanted to go through with the abortion. And I said yes, even though I lied. I really didn't want to have an abortion. The day before the abortion, my mom had to go to the clinic and sign some papers with me since she couldn't go there the day of. The nurses were very friendly. I suppose that's how they sell their abortions, Carrie writes. The next day I woke up early and drove to my boyfriend's house. He was to take me to the clinic. As we pulled up, I felt cold and sick to my stomach. But in my mind, I felt like there was no turning back. I signed in and was called back to fill out a ton of paperwork, get some blood work done, and have an ultrasound. Then I waited for scenes like hours in the waiting room. I remember there was an older woman there who had brought her daughter in for an abortion. I looked at her, sitting in the corner, crying quietly to herself. I wished I could have walked out then, but I didn't. My boyfriend acted childishly the whole time at the clinic. He even left me alone in there while he ran next door to the 7-Eleven to get something to eat. When he came back, they called me to go into the back room. I was put in this room and given a gown. The nurse coldly told me to put on the gown and leave my socks on. Everyone was so nice to me the day before. Why was everyone being so rude to me now? As I sat in the nicely decorated room for about ten minutes shaking, I knew I didn't want to go through with it. I wanted to start crying. But the nurse rushed into the room and brought me to the room where my baby would soon die. The room looked like an ordinary doctor's room except for all the machines in the corner covered with sheets. Soon a nurse dressed in green scrubs and an older doctor came into the room. He introduced himself quickly and rudely and instructed me to place my feet in the stirrups. I can remember looking up at the ceiling and on the ceiling there was a picture of a monkey and next to the monkey the phrase, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I couldn't believe that was up there. Next thing I knew, I was being injected with some form of anesthesia. I became groggy, but was instantly awake as soon as the doctor began the procedure. I remember thinking that I was going to die. I had never experienced so much pain in my life. I was begging him to stop. I started jerking, trying to get away from him. But the nurse kept telling me to calm down or I would hurt myself. I just laid there and cried. I felt like my life had been drained from me. I remember wishing that it was. After the procedure ended, I was brought into the recovery room. There were two women on each side of me. One was sleeping heavily and the other was sleeping with a smirk on her face like she was happy about what she'd just done. I, on the other hand, can remember looking at the vertical blinds on the window feeling nothing but emptiness. Then I realized what I had just done. I had just killed my baby. My thoughts soon vanished when a young woman began screaming in the hall. She had just had the procedure done and was being wheeled into the recovery room. She couldn't walk and was just screaming and crying hysterically. I just wanted to hug her and let her know it would be okay. She calmed down and I remember looking into her eyes. They looked blank, like there was no one there. I knew I had to leave. I told the nurse I was feeling fine, which was a lie, and she gave me my paperwork, my clothes, and prescriptions and sent me on my way. I left the clinic that day, vowing never to return there. The day after the abortion, I woke up early and found that I couldn't walk. I was doubled over in pain. I was rushed to the ER to discover that there was an infection quickly setting in. They gave me several medications to take. I was soon feeling better after a few weeks. After I began feeling better, I began feeling relieved. I began to feel happy that I had had an abortion. 
For some reason, I felt happy that I didn't have to worry about losing my boyfriend. Those feelings didn't last very long, though. By the time January came around, I was feeling terrible. I finally realized how stupid I was for killing my baby. I wanted my baby back so bad, I knew that nothing I did could bring my baby back. I started slipping into depression. I began skipping school, laying in bed, crying because I wanted my baby. I became violent towards my boyfriend for pressuring me into an abortion. I completely ignored my friends. I eventually dropped out of school completely. And there you have the rest of the story. In one case, the physiological damage, the psychological scourgings. So we've seen the political climate, the biblical decree and the diabolical slaughter. Come with me now to the ghastly statistics. The ghastly statistics. And the most graphic elements are over. I know that the Nazi Holocaust was a grisly slaughter. Six million Jews exterminated. Think of it. Six million Jews. But this 30 years war, about which I am speaking, has a casualty fatality rate of not six million. You know what the rate is? Forty million plus. Forty million plus. And we can get numb to this. We must never forget. Not what happened, but what is happening. Forty million in 30 years. Do you know what that number crunches into? 111,000 Per month. 37,000 per day. 154 per hour. 2.6 per minute. The average in 40 years. It would be 3,700 per day. Feminists for Life have written this. Feminists for Life. Did you hear what I said? Feminists for life, who finally are understanding, though they would speak about pro-choice, pro-choice, they're understanding the physiological massacre of women and the psychological meat grinding of women because of abortion. Feminists for life say, today in the U.S., every 36 seconds, a woman lays down her body to have an abortion. And why? What do the statistics say regarding why? Well, supposedly 1% is because of rape or incest. 1% is because of fetal abnormalities. 4% is because of complications for the mother. 50% is because I didn't want to become a single parent. 66% also couldn't afford the child. And 75% the child would interfere with my life. Those are the grisly stats. You even think of issues of health complications, financial complications. A professor in a world acclaimed medical school once posed this medical situation to his students in the classroom. Here is an ethical problem, he said. Here's the family history. The father has, had, has syphilis. The mother has tuberculosis. They already have had four children. The first is blind. The second has died. The third is death. The fourth has TB. Now the mother is pregnant again. The parents have come to you for advice. They're willing to have an abortion. If you decide they should, what do you say? Student groups gathered and collected their various opinions. The professor asked them to give their consultation opinions. All of the groups came back and reported that they would indeed recommend abortion. The professor said, congratulations, you've just terminated the life of Beethoven. But the life really wouldn't be worth living now, would it? Forty million casualties. How many is forty million? 
know what the population of Canada is? 32 million. 40 million casualties. Can we look the other way? Can we let this go? Can we stop leveling blows against this monster? I don't think so. Hiroshima. The atomic bomb was dropped. 90,000 deaths. The dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. Now, since 1973, Roe Earth Wade, there are over 40 million deaths. This would be the equivalent of a Hiroshima mushroom cloud rising up over the American soil every 22 days over the last 30 years. Now, what if North Korea launched a single nuclear warhead and it exploded in the U.S.? We would shudder at the devastation of a mushroom cloud over a metropolitan area in our nation. But every 22 days, 90,000 infants over the last 30 years have been terminated. But it's all away from the headlines, isn't it? There's no mushroom cloud on CNN news or on the front line of the newspaper, is there? That is the ghastly statistics. Now come with me fifthly to the immoral fallout. The immoral fallout. Because of these things, we've exchanged the sanctity of life philosophically in our country for the disposability of life. Haven't we? And a diabolical genie has been let out of the bottle and it's caused devastation be widespread in our country. Why? Simply put, because Roe vs. Wade has taught us very profoundly that life is cheap. Our nation stands by a naive disbelief when we find our teens leaving newborn bloody infants in trash bags. How can this ever happen? How could our children do such a thing? How could they be left behind in hotel waste baskets? Living children, newborns, still with the blood and mucus on them, left in Disney World toilets. How can our children do this? They're simply living consistently with the philosophy, philosophy that was taught to them profoundly by the Roe vs. Wade opinion and which is consistently carried out by the health department's butchering. The immoral fallout. The Grand Rapids Press, one of you gave me this article a couple of years ago. A person wrote this in the public pulse. Well, if you kill a cat with a hammer, you can go to prison for four years, referring to the article, Cat Killer Could Get Four Years in Prison. The writer goes on. Imagine that. What about the person who inserts a sharp instrument into a viable infant's head and sucks out his brains? Oh yeah, I forgot. It's the law of the land. We've come a long way, baby. When a cat has more value than an infant, and a cat's killer goes to jail, and a baby's killer goes scot-free. There was big fuss in the newspaper many months back when in a Copenhagen art gallery there was a presentation of a blender with goldfish in it. And those who passed by would have to make the choice to blend or not to blend. And the article says four goldfish were blended on Saturday. And the animal rights activists were all up in arms, all up in arms about such an abuse of life. Do we not realize that there is baby blending going on every day by the tens of thousands. Contempt for life. Gangs roam our neighborhoods in the U.S. raping and killing joggers. There are recreational beatings to death of walkers. How could somebody ever sit in the trunk of a Chevy and sharp shoot shoppers? What kind of a nation? What's in the head of a nation that would have such a disdain for
for life. Jack the Ripper Kevorkian for years thumbed his murdering nose at the authorities. Physician assisted suicide encouraged in a number of states today. Euthanasia, there's the killing off of weak old people. Euthanasia laws are now appearing on state ballots. Scientists who've already cloned sheep and cats are now working hard to clone human beings for experimental use, for organ harvesting use, and for social engineering purposes. There are now genetic tests available for a pregnant woman, and they're trying to get them more precise. Does your baby have certain genetic problems which will make them vulnerable in later life to certain difficulties such as Alzheimer's disease? If your little baby in the womb has an Alzheimer's gene, we can terminate this baby's life, life not worth living. I wonder what U.S. history would be like without the life of Ronald Reagan. Life not worth living. And then this immoral fallout. Professing Christians. Carefully understand that word I just used. Professing Christians. Conforming to the pattern of the world. Listen to this account of a man named Tim who was told by his, haunting, or by his hunting buddy Tom alongside a fireside in the forest. Tom told about his teen daughter's pregnancy. Tim gives this account of what happened. I asked Tom, because of the pregnancy, what they had decided to do. Would they keep the baby or put it up for adoption? That's when Tom delivered the blow. With the fire burning low, Tom paused for a long time before answering. And even when he spoke, wouldn't look me in the eye. We're considering the alternatives, Tim. We weighed all the options. Then he took a deep breath. We finally made an appointment with the abortion clinic. I took her down there myself. Tim writes, I dropped the stick I'd been poking into the coals and I stared at Tom. And except for the wind in the trees and the snapping of our fire, it was quiet for a long time. I couldn't believe this was the same man who for years had been so outspoken against abortion. He and his wife had even volunteered at a crisis pregnancy center in his city. Heartsick, I pressed Tom about this decision. Tom then made a statement that captured the essence of his problem and the problem of many who have not entered into genuine rest. In mechanical voice, Tom said, I know what I believe, Tim, but that's different than what I had to do. I had to make a decision that had the least amount of consequences for the people involved. So he himself took his daughter to the abortion clinic and was an accessory to the killing of his own grandchild. And he's still defending it, and he's still standing by his decision. Beloved, faith without works is dead. Now, sixthly, the noble resolution. We're almost done. The noble resolution. We need to revive our souls. We can't give up. We can't just say we're done with this and just move on to another issue. We need to make resolution to overcome our battle fatigue and fight on. We need to wield our influence for the downtrodden. As it says there in Proverbs 24, 11, deliver those who are being taken away to death and those who are staggering to slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say, see, we did not know this. Does he not consider it who weighs the heart? And does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his works? 
We cannot turn a deaf ear to the nearly three per minute silent screams that are taking place in our country. And we need to see, there are some people who would think, well, you know, if we're not saving souls with the gospel, why bother? Ever hear that mentality? Beloved, restraining from evil actions is a duty of every Christian. Deliver those who are being taken away to death. As an encouragement regarding noble resolution, I lay before you William Wilberforce. When we get discouraged, it's time to remember the lessons of history, specifically the lessons of 18th century England. It was in 1787 that William Wilberforce, a member of the Parliament and a Christian, decided he would take on one of the most entrenched moral evils of his day, and that was the British slave trade. Wilberforce knew from the start that this would be no easy task. The British Empire depended heavily on the slave trade. Wilberforce knew that in order to succeed, he'd have to go about the matter in a right way. First, he educated himself thoroughly, learning all about slavery and the condition of slave ships. Then he began working with a small but influential group of friends who were equally committed to abolition known as the Clapham sect. They supervised government inquiries into the horrors of the slave trade and exposed it. Wilberforce and his allies then began educating the public regarding the horrors. The first victory was a small one, but it proved that the slave industry was vulnerable. It was a vote in 1788 that restricted the number of slaves that a ship could be allowed to carry based on the ship's tonnage. For the next 19 years... Wilberforce introduced bills banning the slave trade, and year after year, his opponents found ways to defeat him, often playing dirty. Kevin Belmonte writes, Wilberforce faced a constant stream of false accusations and vitriol and death threats and even a challenge to a duel. But after nearly two decades of hard work, it became clear that the log jam was breaking. The public would no longer tolerate commas and human misery. This change in attitude, writes Belmonte, grew directly from the sustained campaign to convince the public of the slave trade's immorality. Finally then, in 1807, 20 years after Wilberforce first began his battle in the House of Commons, the House voted by an overwhelming majority to abolish the slave trade. What's the lesson of Wilberforce's life? Coulson writes, and I'm quoting from Coulson here, despite repeated losses, he kept working. By God's grace, his cause made incremental gains. He didn't demand all or nothing, but eventually carried the day. He then continued his labors, and eventually slavery was outlawed three days before he died in 1833. And you know, we need to adopt such a long-term noble resolution. Though we're dead tired with battle fatigue, we've got to keep delivering the relentless body blows against this monster of abortion. That leaves us then, seventhly, to the incremental encouragements. There are some encouragements. We have a pro-life president in the White House. There are high-tech ultrasound machines that show extraordinary portraits of babies in the womb as mothers are able to see face-to-face their victims. A recently passed Born Alive Infants Protection Act ends the practice of leaving live babies to die after botched abortions. Minnesota and Texas are considering informed consent laws that would include information on fetal pain. The law says this, The woman must be told the fetus feels intense pain during this procedure. And in Texas, the mother yet opting to abort would then need to agree to anesthetizing her baby. Sign a form. I'll anesthetize my child before I abort it. Virginia is considering a law declaring a child legally born once its head emerges into the birth canal. And feminists for life appalled at the physiological and psychological consequences are lobbying on college campuses with a pro-life message. And now there's a recent study 
in Finland that shows that the risk of dying within a year after an abortion is several times higher than the risk of dying after miscarriage or childbirth. Women face injuries to the uterus, the cervix, the urinary tract, infection, hemorrhage, heart failure, embolism, sterilizations, rupture intestines and bowels, coma, and even death. The facts are finally coming out. World Magazine shows that approval of abortions has dipped 10% in the last decade. Teen abortions have now plummeted 40%. And the Zogby's poll shows that the tide is shifting in America. More than two-thirds of Americans now say that they would counsel strongly with a woman against her having an abortion. Eighthly and finally now, the practical action. Pray. What can I do? What can I do? How can I deliver body blows? Pray. Pray that God will deliver children and parents and doctors and nurses from this scourge. Pray for kings and all in authority that we might live tranquil and quiet lives. Pray for Bush and for Frist and for Hastert and for Graham Holm and for Supreme Court justices that they would be nominated, that they would be approved of. Second, speak out. Declare the truth. Truth is powerful. Bernard Nathanson, who was an abortionist, said back in the 60s and early 70s, we fabricated lies. We said that every year there were 100,000 abortions illegally taking place. He said, we lied. We knew there were only 10,000. He said that we said 10,000 women were dying annually because of illegal abortions. We lied. There were only 200 to 250. But he says, and then we said, we said 60% of Americans approve of abortion. We lied. But Nathanson said, we kept speaking the lie. And the lie took on a life of its own. We tell the truth. The truth. The truth is like a hammer. God's Word is like a hammer that breaks the rock. Jeremiah 23, verse 39. Speak out. Speak out on your route. Speak out along the soccer field. Speak out of the grocery store. Speak out. Don't be cowed looking the other way. Lobby and vote. We as Christians, we're not royalty. But in a sense, we are royalty as citizens of this nation. We have authority and influence we wield in our government. And woe be to us if we fail to wield the influence that we have by voting, by writing letters. You write a letter, some senators and representatives say, each letter I see as 200 constituents. Each telephone call I get, I consider that to be 100 constituents. And some rate a calling letter much higher. Make sure that we vote instead of merely forgetting. It's a sacred responsibility we each have as little Caesars. And then support. Support those organizations which fight valiantly for life by financial giving or by time volunteering. In conclusion, dear Christian, if you came in here suffering from abortion battle fatigue, I hope these words have reinvigorated your soul to again wake up and take your sword against this diabolical monster and hack and hew away until the monster retreats or until our Savior returns. And if you are here with your blood stained with an abortion, that may be the case. Remember Paul, whose hands were stained with the blood of innocent Christians, whom he himself had persecuted, wrote this. 1 Timothy 1.15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. And this hour the Lord Jesus stands with the fountain of cleansing wide open. And he says, come and wash yourself. Wash yourself in the blood of the Lord Jesus, which can make the foulest clean. I lay before you the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, and free. May God help us to respond in the right way
to these things. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us life and life eternal. We pray that we might be valiant soldiers who fight in our generation as we ought. And may we not faint. And may we serve you with all of our heart and strength and soul. We ask for your mercy. We pray that you would do things that cause us to sing in days to come. And for those apart from the Lord Jesus, or those who are terribly damaged by the effects of sin, we pray that they would find a balm in the Lord Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen.